Hey everybody, welcome back to Trek Yards. I'm Captain Foley. And uh, the founders are everything. Long live the founders. They the Victory ones who, is life. They rule Trek Yards and, and we're here to service them. And, 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 uh, well, if that's the case, then Mark Schmidt must be a founder because he was the one that uh, requested this special episode. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at the Jem'Hadar battle cruiser. Battleship, Stuart. This isn't the battle cruiser. Battleship. Battleship. It obvious. It's the massive one, which is should feel very opposing. <laughs> this is the Egos miniature. It's one of the newer ones. So this is the battleship. Although really, you'd be forgiven to not recognize it. It's only in three episodes. So um, you know, that's a lot of CGI effort in building a model just for that. As this was one of the few, one of the very very few models in DS9 that was only ever CG. And you'd be forgiven too to not know the size of this thing. It is pretty substantially huge, which when we take a look at sizing, will be quite evident. This is a game changer. It Therefore, it wasn't in the game very much. Oh, it would have been a game changer. Uh, you know, it would have... It's like when you see certain battles with the um, the Derodex, they always have to descale it in the DS9 battles because if they're at a true scale, it would absolutely dwarf some other ships close to it. So there is always a bit of that fidgeting. So this thing is massive. Uh, but Stuart, do you remember... The first time we saw this ship in DS9 in the episode Valiant, then once again in an episode later on, and then again in the final episode for One Shot. Do you remember what you thought when you first saw it? it to me, it looks too much like the cruiser. They two look too similar. Um, I know there's a lot of differences between the two of them, but I mean, at first glance, they have the same basic shapes, basic, same basic geometries a little bit. So you, you can be mistaken. Plus, we didn't see it that often, especially side by side with a cruiser. Um, would have been nice to get a comparison, but I just seen it so little. I thought they were the same thing for the longest time. Um, I do remember it when the Valiant crew attacked it, though. Um, I thought it was a cool looking ship, but even there, you don't get a true sense of size because the Defiant, like strafing the bottom of it, it's like, damn, the Defiant doesn't look that small. The Defiant would be so small compared to this thing. Um, and just the shots you get, it's like you don't get a sense of the scale, really. Yes and no. Scale's tricky because the Defiant is very small. And the fact that you can you can have an entire scene where it's just going across the hull. I mean, this, if it's flying across the hull, it's going at good speed. If it does it for more than like 10, 15 seconds, you know that the ship is massive. But it definitely stood out. I remember thinking, that's cool, and being surprised it never made an appearance. Like, actually an appearance. Apart from its, obviously, its starring role. It, you know, we've talked about it off camera a couple of times. And it would have been great if just to see it, you know, warp in with a Jem'Hadar fleet and be like, <sighs> and then all the little other ships and we're like, oh my god, this is this is the fleet, this is the fleet killer, and that's all you need, you know. Uh, they never didn't, they never quite did that. Uh, but Stuart, the next picture is of its first appearance, and as you can see, CGI. Uh, next shot again. This is where we start to get a sense that maybe it's pretty big, but you really can't tell. The next shot is it strafing, and I mean. It, it, <laughs> Looks pretty big from that. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around actually how big. I mean, that's several miles at least. Next shot, which I didn't actually remember, is a shot that actually goes through the top uh, through bit, which I actually thought I'd never realize it did. You can see it's a through bit. But then, Stuart, let's actually keep the audience out of suspense. And obviously, the Eagle's middle miniature has a scale and stuff, although this is the default CG scale. We always go with the default. So this next render is a much cleaner, easier to see scale of the two ships put together, this is how much of David and Goliath uh, it was. This diddly little, really powerful warship against a massive, 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 massive warship. Your thoughts, Stuart? See, I did. I never got that sense from the episode for sure. Um, uh, it just it didn't seem that large. But now you're really. seeing it. Does it make sense? It does. It's more of a. There's more of a correlation between like a Star Destroyer and the Millennium Falcon here. Yeah. I mean, Star Destroyers I think might be a little bit longer. Yeah. Uh, a little bit bigger, more vol yeah. internal volume. But um, as far as scale comparison goes, that's a good, uh, yeah. good measurement. Um, but yeah, this is actually pretty impressive. Um, I don't know, man. I can see. I can see it flying through that upper part now with that size. I mean, that's perfect. Um, and this is where I find when people worry about scale or whatnot, you know, we use a default CG scale, and in most shots, obviously there's exceptions, they run to a certain scale. So when I have the Deep Space Nine at the correct scale, put this real Defiant 
and it fits exactly in the docking port, therefore making it can't be the 175, can't be the 125, and it looks perfect next to, you know, this. It's like, well, yeah, they all seem to match up, and yes, they might have changed for one shot or two, but when they design them at the scale, you can tell this is what they're intended to be. But doesn't this just make you appreciate, well, it, it can go either way, either how efficient the, the Defiance warp engines are to be able to reach ultra high speeds at this small, or how absolutely massive the warp coils are of the, I mean, D dozens of times bigger is just the outer warp engines than an entire warship can go 9.9 .9 whatever. That's a huge. I mean, what does that say to you? Just the, just the, like they're both powerful, but the warp coils, the size, I just think is dependent on, like they need the bigger size to move more more mass, more bulk, or create a larger warp bubble, obviously, because it obviously can't go faster than warp 10. You know, it can't go faster than warp 9.99 .9, whatever. Um, I'm not sure what the top speed of this thing is. Well, I never invented uh, it, so I don't think anyone knows. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but it just... <laughs> and we're not sure if the warp coils take up those hole nacelles or if they're much smaller. Because when you compare this to other ships, um, those nacelles are massive. They're bigger than most ships. Like, and there's even, like, several as well. There's top ones. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You mentioned... Uh, if there's just warp coils, I rewatched the CGI scenes in preparation for this episode, and it's funny how they also put a lot of care and attention to building this model. But whoever did the post effects, because often in Star Trek, the model people, the VFX house, made the space shots, and they gave it to a separate house, separate company, to do the weapon effects so they can do them slightly quicker, slightly cheaper. That's what they've been doing since TNG. And if you watch the episode, the, the Valiant's being shot at uh, from behind, from the warp nacelle from the wing from all these sorts of weird places and you think well there's no how can they fit weapon turret in the wing and you realize they could fit several hundreds if you want a bloody turret in the nacelle you got space yeah. you got yeah. goddamn space so it, you don't because we don't do ships this big in trek speaking of then the next picture i was very careful here to put the three main dominion ships bug ship cruiser and battleship ds9 for scale and then what you could say are the foremost pride of the fleet of these different races and the Defiant. Your reaction to that, Stuart? Insane. Yes. <laughs> Insanity. Like, you'd think the Enterprise E was much larger than that. Um, but, damn, and compared to Deep Space Nine, an actual station, my mind is just blown. And like like you were just saying, you know, uh, or as we were just talking about with the warp, the cell, with the warp coils, um, they could take up a small fraction of that in the cell. Um, the only reason that a cell is that big is maybe to accommodate more engineering rooms, engineering labs, weapons turrets, as you said. You know, there's so much you could fit in there because I don't think that the warp coils necessarily scale up the same way that, you know, the uh, cells I mean, do. Maybe if you look at the outer strips, those little uh, purple lit bits, maybe each of those, if it's one, two, three, four, five, those maybe have five separate sets of coils. So you have massive redundancy. And then they use like you know three pairs in unison, and then if someone get blown out, they do more. And because I mean, you also think the Negvar is quite a big beefy ship, and the Nerixon's quite a big beefy ship. It's just no. I mean, they're dwarfed, and, and as I was trying to say, you don't get these sorts of big ships in Trek, and that might have been part why they didn't use it, because it breaks the scale. You know, it, it goes so far outside what is every single race is building. This is why Discovery, again, breaks the scale, because it's, it's too big, which means the other ship is too big, and the, uh, the Klingon men are too big, and it just breaks it. So this ship, again, it's like it is multitude bigger than anything, you know? Yeah, and it, it, it kind of translates when you look at the, the windows, for example. Uh, the windows on those inner bits are huge. Compare them to, like... Compare them to the Enterprise E, for example. They're like larger. Like these would be, would be windows that would be like football fields big. <laughs> and the, and uh, I mean, it's just. It, so did they even have a sense of the scale that this thing was when they built it? Yeah, it's in the magazine at Eagle Moss. The sketch actually has the define, and it's teeny. So yeah. Wow. I just think it's the model. I mean, if you go if you jump, if you jump back to the first picture, this shows more blatantly. Yeah, you've got. There's the inner recessed detail with the humongous windows and you got the diddly windows and mm, which, I mean two window scales well, certainly and two window scales is weird for a ship anyway yeah it, it, uh, we do assume... see it though we've seen it a few times for sure yeah um, 
even got to be fair. Even the refit has that. It's got the smaller portholes and it's got the longer, elongated ones. Um, but there's two, and they've got a distinct purpose. Now I'm, I'm guessing these are all a different function. But yeah, then we jump to the top scale again, and you can still sort of see them. Even the diddly windows are bigger than a conventional window, and, and given the fact that the bug ship has zero windows, um, because you know whatever. But this is why you know, for me, this ship compared to the bug ship, which is very effective, the cruiser. This is again dozens of times bigger. I mean, for me, this is like we built three. It's a fleet ship. This carries, you know, two million troops, well, a million troops. You know, this this is the ship that you put the changeling contingency on that carries, you know, five cruisers that carries all the factories to build all the ships in this one. This is the one ship you build, uh, and then it builds everything else after it. I mean, that's all the vibe I get. This is a fleet ship. Yeah. But I mean, how many how many resources are required to build this thing? When, if you're in a war, would you want more? Would you want to build ten cruisers, or one of these, with the same amount of resources? I mean, if you have the shipbuilding facilities to do both, build ten cruisers and one of these at the same time, go for it. But the amount of resources and time and effort and troops and everything you need for this ship is would take away. Is it better to have a couple big ships or a lot of middle-sized ships that are very capable? I mean, you got to balance all that out with your shipyard. You're right, right, but this is the Dominion. And that's a slightly different paradigm. I mean, this ship defeated a Defiant class, yes, with ensigns, sure, but defeated a Defiant class in minutes with a few weapons. I mean, this thing could blow away Defiant easily. They say in several episodes of DS9 that... Um, in the end, we just watch Pale, Moon, Pale Moonlight again, and they talk about how while the Dominion have crippled half your shipyards, Dominion, all of theirs are 100%, and they're building more shipyards because they've got their slave labor force, in essence, it's, the Gem Hadar. It's so, like I mean, playing Star Trek Armada. <laughs> You've decimated the enemy's shipyards, oh, yeah. but you're still building more and more shipyards with more and more ships. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. So I can see, I mean, this, this only appears in the last season, I believe, Valiant was the last season, and you only see three ever. So my guess is that, yeah, they obviously built like 600 of them and then they were like, well, now cloned another or grew another 5,000 Jem'Hadar, they're all just going to build it. I mean, yeah, why why wouldn't you build something that can single-handedly jump into a fleet battle and take out, you know, I mean, the Scimitar, again, why build something so big? Yeah, but it ripped apart everything at four instantly. So this thing, I mean, they had enough time, they had enough resources, they had enough people because they can grow them and build them. I mean, even the Vortas are being grown or cloned, whatever. So I think for the Dominion... Yes, this ship is a totally a valid situation because it, only one of these, as we see two are at Cardassia, one of these ships should provide enough folly to at least delay an enemy's, you know, uh, retake of a planet. I mean, how many ships do you have to send against this to be even remotely effective? Uh, one thing that was in... I forget the next picture, actually. This is, a, this is a fact files rendered from the 90s. This is the same CG model, but rendered back in the 90s just because it's quite a nice shot. Um, it looks more like a miniature, I think, this one. Rather than CG, I think it did quite a cool job. Originally, this was this was designed and intended to actually launch uh, bug ships off the wings. Mm, mm -hmm. um, uh, John said that when Jim Martin designed the bug ships, they're bugs, and so he thought this is like a spider launching, you know, spider flowing out, you know, kind of like that, that that mothership vibe. And so it was going to do yeah. that, but they said it would be too complicated in CG. Uh, so now, if you then picture, it's got like 150 bug ships. I mean, I was building them as you go. I mean, I, I mean, it's, and could you imagine picture, picturing seeing bug ships launch out of this? It would look like Cylon Raiders being launched out of a base star. Yep. Uh, it would have the same feel to it for sure. Um, but no, that'd be cool. Actually, that would uh, it would validate the size, and you know, make it something that yeah, it would fly in, launch its contingent, and uh, those are very capable ships on their own. So. Yeah, I have no issues with that. I wish that actually would have been a thing. And it could have been that that was a thing in universe. We just never got that far to learn that, you know. Uh, next picture, though, is the bottom view. And you can see the uh, these things, which are, I mean, they have a little bit of glow. I'm not really sure what they're trying to be. Because it'd be odd if they were, like, warp engines, given there's so many of them. But I don't know. What do you think? That's the thing, actually. I have the cruiser here, the little Eagle Mouse cruiser. And the thing that bothers me about this one is that attachment on the bottom. It's so unnecessary and seems so tacked on that, yeah, what is it? I mean, is it? It could be anything. It could be a supplementary power power system. 
um, could that be holds reserve the torpedoes. batteries. <laughs> so all just torpedoes. <laughs> or, or a weapons pod, yeah. What if they were literally cargo bays that had the raw minerals to build the ships? Like, just yeah. raw materials. Yeah. It would it would make sense, yeah, for sure. Big tanker bits. You know, from, from the bottom there, when you show that model, they almost look like um, Breen ships. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> Except well, they're symmetrical. John Eve's style is recognizable once you know. Yeah. No, those seem tacked on to me. And even on the cruiser, this bottom part just does not seem to fit. Like, it doesn't work for me. It's like, why is that... Why is that there? Integrated a bit more. The front view is kind of cool, though, with them. Oh, yeah. 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 The windows here um, feel more scale-related. Like, they look more along that middle spine. Back, you can see the bigger windows on the inset, on the wings there, um, which are substantially larger. Uh, next picture, though, is from the back, and you can see even more purple glows. It could be that not all purple glows are important. And what better way to fool an enemy than go, look at all the purple glows we have. Hit those things because they're important. Target all your fire over there. Um, meanwhile, the, the part that's really important doesn't glow at all. Oh, um. <laughs> it's a conspiracy. I mean, it's a good tactic when you think about it. Yeah, there's there's almost too many glows. It just doesn't... Because if, if those are all warp or nacelle units, it's like, why, you need, why do you need so many? I understand the ship is big. So the next shot uh, just shows the weapons it's firing. Has these big pulse things. The shoot pretty much everywhere. Pretty much everywhere. Yeah. Well, this thing reminds me a lot of the um, of the scimitar. I mean, even the little things on the top are very similar. Even the cruiser uh, looks very similar to the scimitar from the front. This one here, uh, it's got those same shapes, and uh, and that that thing had like what seventy four torpedo launchers or disruptors or whatever well wasn't that part of the scimitar's thing was to go toe to toe with dominion stuff in the dominion war yes yes so i guess they took a leaf out of the dominion kill everything book uh, next two pictures are its last big appearance with the full fleet and this is the only real time we get to see it well the only time we get to see it with a fleet and i think you know obviously you got the perspective problem with this with everything being further away and obviously they might actually have put made them small in the shot to work. Um, but you get a sense they are the biggest thing in the Armada, and then some, and it's fair to say. And you only see four of them, and I'm I'm happy to buy the only of four. I think they do say all the ships are back at Cardassia. Because four sounds about right. You've got one for like different parts of the border. It's yeah. a pretty impressive shot. I mean, you'll see a lot of little ships in the background there that you can't tell what they are. I love the foreground little turret pieces as well. Again, this this feels a lot like um, Armada, where you build your little phaser turrets and you know for defending your base. Good ship design. I I really like it. Um, I just wish it would have been used a little bit more. Well, I I think it's also meant to be. If you go to the next picture, is the last picture, the first picture. I think I think this for me the sense I get is this was. Because so we know the Dominion lost access to the wormhole, so whoever was there was stuck there. So I get the sense this is the first of the Alpha Quadrant designs, which was very custom built to this what is needed. And that's why it's not quite as organic, as sleek, as bug-like as every other ship. It's like, what do we have? What can we use? What's our mantra? mantra? That's why it does feel different and maybe not polished, because it's kind of like, you know, where you number 64, build this battleship. Like, you want it to be how big? And make it 10% bigger. It's like... Yes, founder. <gasps> and seven or eight wounds die in the process of creating it because they all suck. Meanwhile, there's lots of lots of internal space. It's just empty, empty rooms. Just huge, huge chambers of empty rooms. Oh, it's big on the outside. Well, each uh, each Vorta, because I don't know if you know this, but uh, uh, if a Vorta designs a ship, you know, custom, which is why you never give them ship designs, each Vorta's personal quarters are the size of a skyscraper. That would make sense. Because he, he needs it. Yeah, well, for their ego to fit in there, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's like eight way units. They'll have a big, like, building themselves. Yeah. And there's, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think this is actually quite a cool show. I think this is its best angle by a long way. I think this, it looks good. I think the angles are good. Um, I like the fact that the colors are chosen are interesting. The front pins being different color are good. I also kind of like, we haven't mentioned it, but the weird way the, the nacelles connect. They kind of taper in, and it looks relatively thin compared to how much space there is, but that's kind of futuristic. Um, and as you can see in the Egomos, the uh, middle bit, while it looks solid there, no, it is actually hollow, and it does go yeah. through, and yeah, it's hard to see uh, in these renders, but... Uh, 
Yeah, and that negative space design, uh, I really like those in ships. Uh, especially with larger ships, the negative space works really well. Uh, so th I think that looks great, actually. And you never see that in the show, unfortunately. Um, but with that model, the Eagle Moss model, you can really see it. And I, I, I think that's a fantastic um, approach to this. So, um, But yeah, I mean, cool ship. I just wish we would have seen more of it. It's kind of like the Star Destroyer of the Star Trek universe, I guess. Is a good, good comparison. So, and definitely a Borg fighter as well. I mean, I would love to see this thing fight against a cube. I think it could possibly win against a cube. Honestly, I, I would agree with you. Yes, I, I think it's like three quarters the length of a cube. I think. Um, but anyway, thanks to Eagle Moss for making a cool miniature. You can go find that at their web store and or other places if you see a conventional or whatnot. And well, thanks. The link, there's a link down below. They can go to click <gasps> and get that. And if you do that, if you click the link and fill up your shopping cart with this one and some other ones, you get into the discount code TREKYARDS, save yourself some money, and uh, it helps out everybody. So definitely go do that. And of course, thank you to Mark Schmidt for commissioning this episode. You can also commission an episode on a ship or a more detailed look at a ship. At email trekyards.homeyard.com or support us on Patreon, the monthly donation service, or join us on our weekly Super Chat Lives. They're amazing. We, look, we do episode reviews and do breaking news when that happens. You can join us, talk to us and help support the channel and keep it going to these awesome ship reviews and other cool things. And don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification icon, and check out all the cool links down in the description below. Lots of cool ways to support the channel, as he mentioned, plus some other cool stuff and goodies down there, so check it out. So until next time, guys, and another great ship, or live, or whatever we do, um, I'm Captain Foley. I'm Colonel Gangs. See you Bye later, guys. guys. Victory is life.